1 Corinthians, ninth chapter. If you would be so kind as to meet me there. <clears throat> now, if you will recall, uh, this, of course, will be part two to a teaching we started at the basically the beginning of the ninth chapter in 1 Corinthians. <clears throat> Appreciating the Apostle, because the Apostle was having some trouble with some folks there in Corinth. Um, it's slowly coming out, and it's going to come out more and more as we go through the epistle, but especially as we get into 2 Corinthians, which I'm assuming at this point we're going to follow into that after we're done with 1 Corinthians, that there are outsiders who have come into the church and have been influencing the people there at Corinth. Remember, Paul is the one who started this church, if you will, he was the one that came to Corinth. We see that in the, in the 18th chapter, for instance, of, of uh, the book of Acts. We see that he comes in there. He spends uh, an entire year there that's going on. The gospel is being ministered. These people are being pulled out from heinous ex life experiences, horrible things. I mean, everything from, uh, we can't just say a loose moral situation, but everything from homosexuality, male and female homosexuality going on, um, uh, those who are in it, within the context of, a, of an immoral cultural situation that involves having sex with young boys and witchcraft that is taking place and uh, false religions and the worship of other gods and other idols and, and they've got a lot of baggage and they've got a lot of damage these folks have got and part of this damage is starting to come out in regards to do we really value the Apostle Paul you know and which is, of course, leading us to this entire scenario right here where I'm asking you through the, the title, Appreciating the Apostle, or Do You Value or Undervalue Ministry? Um, uh, Paul, Paul speaks to them at the beginning about how that some of the apostles, he, Barnabas, and some others, have a right, of course, to expect some kind of remuneration for what they're doing. And the people are thinking, no, we don't need to do that. And at the same time, Paul is, is fighting this issue of traveling teachers that were known to go about um, the various areas around the Roman Empire and hire themselves out. Mostly they were philosophical teachers. Sometimes they're religious, but mostly philosophical. And they would hire themselves out uh, for a certain fee. And Paul, one of the things he didn't want to do is he didn't want to be associated with that type of a scenario. I mean, obviously, he didn't want that. But if we back it up just a little bit before we get into today's text and catch a little bit of context here, he says, of course, at chapter 9, verse 1, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you. We'll come back to that idea of others because it's going to show up in today's text. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. My defense to those who examine me is this. Do we not have a right to eat and drink? Uh, do we not have a right to take along a believing wife, even as the rest of the apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or do only Barnabas and I not have a right to refrain from working? So you can see right away by the context that some people were, were throwing a little bit of a hissy fit in regards to even giving Paul the basics of remuneration. You know, do we not have a right to eat and drink? Remember, Jesus said in Matthew 10 and verse 10, when he was sending the boys out to minister to the people of Israel, share the gospel, that the very basic thing that they should be expecting would be food and drink in regards to remuneration. And he went on to say that, that the laborer, the one who was laboring in the word, laboring in the word evangelistically and doctrinally, is worthy of his hire is worthy. And we've been through some corresponding passages that are a part of that. And then in verse 5, some of them were complaining about the fact that, wow, ah, we're having to take care of these guys' wives, too. I mean, it's, it's like they're out there. They're doing their thing. They're teaching. They're evangelizing. But then, uh, you know, I didn't sign up to, you know, support their wives. But then we talked to you about how that the ministry of the wives is every bit as important as the ministry of the men themselves because the wives are supporting these men. They, these gals are making, it, are making it happen so that the, the guys can be free to a great degree to be out there with soundness of mind and body and mentally and physically because the wives are loving and supporting them, you see. And we talked to you quite a bit uh, about that. Do we value their ministry? And then the question 
question was, he's back with Barnabas in here, do Barnabas and I not have a right to refrain from working? Uh, who at any time, he says in verse 7, serves as a soldier at his own expense, who plants a vineyard and does not eat the fruit of it, who tends a flock and does not use the milk of the flock. And so he uses the example of a soldier, um, a farmer, one who is a shepherd. Do these people do this work for free? Of course not. You know, of course they should they should be expecting some kind of remuneration. He says in verse eight, "I am not speaking these things according to human judgment, am I? Or does not the law also say these things?" So now he appeals to the word of God. He appeals to the law out of Deuteronomy twenty-five, verse four, in verse nine here, where he says, "For it is written in the law of Moses, quote, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. God is not concerned about oxen, is he?" Now. Of course, the quote stops after the word threshing. You don't muzzle the ox while he is threshing. The idea being is that some owners, as the ox was stomping out, threshing out the grain as it would be going in circles, turning that, that huge wheel and pulling that wheel along, that of course the, the grain that had been then crushed would be right in front of the ox as it moved along. And some of the owners of these oxen would of course, you know, put a muzzle. Uh, on the oxen so that they wouldn't eat up the guy's profits and this kind of a thing. Paul's, Paul is quoting out of the text in the Old Testament, yes, it, it is, of course, a right thing in regards to not refusing sustenance to your animal, but he's real quick was saying that the original intention was not about withholding food from your working animal. It really is not about that when he says in the question at the bottom of verse 9, God is not concerned about oxen, is he? Or is he speaking altogether for our sake? Yes, for our sake it was written, because the plowman ought to plow in hope, the thresher to thresh in hope of sharing the crops. And we focused on the idea of hope or an expectation, you know? And we talked to you a lot about in various passages, not just this one right here, but other associative passages that have to do with the fact that it's remuneration on other levels, not just finances, you know, but on other levels as well. What about just being here? What about, what about uh, uh, valuing the ministry that's taking place when the, uh, the, the elders, let's say in our case, you know, have, have uh, pulled together uh, the teaching of the word and they brought and prepared it and then people don't come, Right? How about valuing it that way? And we talked to you ab about that. D just different aspects of, of showing value, you know, and some folks uh, value by, you know, extra time in prayer in regards to uh, the needs of the, uh, the elders and so on and so forth. But there ought to be a plowing and a threshing in hope. And we've pointed out to you that those words plowman, thresher, these are tough jobs. You know, and he's saying that the ministry of the word is a tough thing, too. It's not easy to do. And that's why he's choosing these, these physical, laborious type of, uh, type of statements here. Those who plow, those who, who thresh, should be doing it with a certain degree of expectation. And then he ended this last teaching in verse 11 with, If we sowed spiritual things in you, is it too much? if we reap material things from you? And of course, the obvious answer is what? No, no of course not. It's not. Um, and so, uh, here we are now, still in the midst of this subject, but we're going to shift it up just a little bit here, moving on to part two of this exact same uh, subject here. And we're going to talk about, first of all, appreciating a righteous remuneration. We can appreciate that. There is a righteous remuneration, and he talks about this, even so much so that God has established, just like he did in the Old Testament, that in the New Testament, those who preach the gospel or make their living from the gospel in verse 14, and that's a remuneration that we show appreciation for. And secondly, we'll talk about appreciating a ministry that is under compulsion. Paul wants to make it clear that he is compelled to bring the ministry of the word to the Corinthians in this case, that it's a compulsion that God has given him. That this is not something he's just decided, well, I, I, I think being in the ministry is kind of a cool living. You know, you can kind of be out on your own out there. You know, nobody gets to tell you what to do. And uh, they give you money. So I think I'm going to, you know, fall into that. No, there is a supernatural, if you will, ultra natural, would probably be better, uh, compulsion that is divine, that has its origins from heaven, from God's throne, where God grabs a man and sets him apart unto the work of the ministry. And there is a 
depressing compulsion. And we'll consider some examples, not just Paul, but other examples of that as we move through that. And then thirdly, appreciating a gospel of no charge. Because really at the end of the day, Paul would rather not charge at all, just do it for free, not charge, not ask for anything, uh, than to have a bunch of people uh, begin to criticize him, saying, well, he's just doing it to take advantage of us, you know, or, or whatever, or he's asking for too much, and that's what's really going on right here. And I mean, you know, I mean, I, I don't walked away from these people a long time ago. Uh, clearly, I'm nothing like the Apostle Paul, clearly. Because, I mean, if people treated me like they treated, pff, go do your thing, man. I'll go down the road to somebody else. I mean, this is really an act of grace where God is keeping him right there. And it's not that Paul didn't have these, uh, these uh, types of uh, frustrations. He certainly did. We've seen it elsewhere. But it's just amazing, these Corinthian people. So as we go through these last few verses... Um, you know, we need to be asking ourselves, you know, where do I stand in regards to this? I want you to ask yourself that. Where do I stand in regards to valuing the ministry that comes to me? Do I value it? Do I undervalue it? And if so, how do I value it? How do I show that I value it? Or where could I maybe do a little bit better in regards to that? Now, by me saying that to you, I'm not, you know, I'm not punching along here for some kind of raise. I'm just saying there's an aspect here that is good for you. See, it's good for you as well as encouraging for me or any of the other elders. I want us to stay thankful. I want us to stay thankful and appreciative of what God has done for us, first through his election, his electing love, and then through his son, and then providing shepherds uh, for us to keeping us fed and keeping us strong and moving forward. We want to be thankful and show that there is a value here uh, that we do appreciate and, and just don't take it for granted. So let's consider appreciating, first of all, a righteous remuneration. And that starts in verse 12. Let's just read 12 through 14. He says, if others share the right over you, that is the right of verse 11, if we sowed spiritual things in you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share the right over you, do we not more? Nevertheless, we did not use this right, but we endure all things so that we will cause no hindrance to the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who perform sacred services eat the food of the temple and those who attend regularly to the altar have their share from the altar? So he's bringing over that Old Testament priestly example. Verse 14, so also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. Pretty strong, pretty direct Paul is being uh, in regards to this. So let's consider verse 12 right here. He brings up this idea of others. Remember we, we saw others, verse 12, if others share this right over you, do we not more? Um, back in verse 2 we saw this reference to others. If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you. So there were these others, they're unnamed, uh, and Paul says in verse 2 that they didn't consider Paul to be an apostle. Well, they're in the church, apparently, and they're having an effect on these people. And now he brings the exact same word up, alloy, uh, the plural form, others. He brings it up again now in verse 12. If others share the right over you, wait a minute, wait a minute. Meaning that those others in verse 2 that were questioning whether Paul was an apostle or not, meaning now that those same others in verse 12, because they're the same, are sharing the right over them. In other words, what's that saying? That's saying that the Corinthians are paying these others. They're remunerating them. And they're the ones that are denying what Christ said about Paul, that he's an apostle. And the Corinthians are supporting those people? Yeah, that's what's happening. If others share the right over you, do we not more? Or, like the Net Bible says, very good right here, are we not more deserving? And the answer is, of course, yes. Paul and the other apostles are more deserving. Are we not more deserving? I like how it says we right there. Are we not more? Nevertheless, we did not use this right, but we endure all things so that we will cause no hindrance to the gospel of Christ. Who's this we right here? Well, it actually goes back to uh, verse 4. 
when he says, my defense to those who examine me is this. Do we not have a right to eat and drink? Do we not have a right to take along a believing wife, even as the rest of the apostles, the brothers of the Lord, and Cephas, that's Peter? Or do only Barnabas and I have a right to refrain from working? So this is the we. It's the other apostles. It's Barnabas. It's Peter. It's the so-called half-brothers of the Lord Jesus Christ who are also on the road and are evangelizing and deserve to be valued. He says back to verse 12, do we not have more of this right? Well, of course, because they're the ones called by Christ. They're the ones whom Christ is demonstrating through miracle, through sign, through wonder, through the fact that there are churches starting up, that there are people coming out of hedonism and paganism, and they're professing faith in Christ, and they're bringing forward their witchcraft articles in, in Ephesus and burning them openly in the streets and destroying them. He says in the middle of 12, nevertheless, we did not use this right. In other words, they were not walking around going, you know what? I'm not doing the Bible study tonight because, you know what? You guys, you just, you know, you don't bring us anything. I mean, you just expect to just keep on. He says, no, no. We just keep plowing forward. Remember, Paul, he could make his own living. And he's going to talk about that, isn't he? He's going to make his own living, you know, and he's just going to proceed on with his business. But he's going to keep bringing the word to them and not force them into this remuneration type scenario. And there's a reason for that. And he'll talk about that in just a little bit. Middle of 12, he says, nevertheless, we did not use this right, but we endure all things. We put up with all these things is what he's saying, so that we will cause no hindrance to the gospel of Christ. Interesting. We're not going to ask for remuneration because we don't want to hinder the gospel of Christ. A couple things to focus on here. When he talks about not hindering the gospel of Christ, it's not the gospel itself that's in danger of being hindered per se. It's their perception of what the gospel is relative to their lack of maturity, relative to their lack of valuing the Apostle Paul in this case and, and the others. Now when he says we will not cause any hindrance to the gospel of Christ, egkopi is the Greek, egkopi. <coughs> Very fascinating because often an egkopi was something that was done during times of warfare and military. If you were trying to uh, uh, move down the road, as it were, away from an enemy, maybe you were being pursued by an enemy, a lot of times what the soldiers would do is they would break up the, the road. They would like blow it up kind of a thing. Uh, chop it up, you know, plow it up, all of that business, so that the army that's coming after you would not have a smooth road. Obviously, they would have to rebuild the road. So it's, it's a hindrance, isn't it? It stops everything. He says, he says, basically, that's what's happening right here. He says, I'm going to put up with this lack of, of remuneration, which really is just you guys showing a lack of value, so that we don't hinder the gospel. In other words, if I start asking you, yeah, go ahead, pay, or yeah, we're not going to do this until you up the ante, you know, or you ought to be bringing us better food than this or something, something like that, because you're so darn immature, you're so darn immature that you're going to actually let the gospel itself be affected as to whether you're going to believe it or not, whether you're going to keep walking with the Lord or not. If, if we suddenly, you know, receive that which is our right to receive in the first place, which is just remuneration, showing value. Because when you show the apostle value and you show the elders value, you are valuing Christ, who is the one who raised them up and, and brought them to you in the first place. And so <laughs> there is this hindrance. I wonder, I wonder if any of us ever feel like I'm hindering the gospel of Christ by my attitude. Am I hindering it by my attitude or am I promoting it? I got to ask myself that. Am I hindering it or am I promoting it? And could I maybe improve on my promoting of the gospel of Christ? Maybe here in my church, maybe in my neighborhood or in, amongst my family members or, or something like that. How can I stop from blowing up the road behind me so that these people can come on forward in a positive way in the gospel of Christ? 13, do you not know? 
that those who perform sacred services eat the food of the temple, and those who attend regularly to the altar have their share from the altar. And of course, now he's reaching back to the Old Testament example of the priests that are there in the temple, that they made their living and received their pay, if you will, their remuneration from the sacrifices of the people. And you might want to write down some passages that speak about that. Leviticus 6 is a good place to start. Leviticus 6, verses 16 through 17. And then also verse 26 of the same 6th chapter of Leviticus. All of chapter 7 of Leviticus speaks about this. All of chapter 7, as well as Leviticus chapter 18, verses 18 through 24, talks about support for these men under the Old Covenant. And by the way, this is automatic. You know, the law was the law. There was no valuing of the ministry uh, of, the, of the priest from a heart kind of position. Rather, it was just a case of you had to bring these offerings, and the priest got his tenth. He got his tithe, and then, of course, he would have to tithe from that, as well as other provisions that were, that were put on the people to bring in. Uh, the heart was hardly engaged under this practice. And Paul is saying there's something better than that that's going on. You're not like these folks under the old covenant who are under this law, and it's just do, do, do. Bring the offering. Bring your tithe of the, of the cattle. Bring your tithe of the first fruits and this kind of a thing. It's expected, and it's what you do. They did have free will offerings under the old covenant, but, but the emphasis here that onto these passages that I've given you has to do with the people bringing their, 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 uh, their sacrifices because they had to. So it wasn't really a case of showing appreciation towards the ministry of the priests. It's something that would have been automatic. But now Paul moves from that to now where your heart is engaged under the new covenant. And you can say to the Lord how much you value him by valuing those whom he has given to you to minister. And so we see that in verse 14, so also he says... The Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. So also, the Lord directed. In other words, the Lord directed the people under the old covenant uh, to bring in their offering, and then, then the priests would receive their, their tithe from that. But guess what? Now, the Lord directs those who proclaim the gospel, notice, to get their living from the gospel. Now, who is he speaking to here? He's speaking to those who are in the ministry, those who are bringing the gospel. He's not speaking to the average person in the pew, per se, right now. So the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel. He's directing it to me, that I should get my living from the gospel, he's saying right here. Now, obviously, um, that can't be necessarily meaning absolutely in every circumstance, in every place, in every church, you know, in every town, wherever you live, because some people, you know, like with our church, I know all of you do the best you can as unto the Lord, and the Lord makes up the difference, you know, and it's fabulous. No problem whatsoever, you know. Uh, but obviously there are situations where sometimes uh, the pastor, or maybe more than one, um, the money is not quite equal to you know, what is happening. And so they got a secondary job, or maybe they're doing it part-time, or something along, along those lines. But the principle remains the same. That what each church should be doing is freeing up uh, at least one teaching elder, at least one, to be able to be full-time uh, ministering the word, studying the word, in prayer, available to the people. Now, obviously, one guy, depending upon how big the, you know, the congregation is, can't do it all, even in our church. As small as ours, it's, isn't it wonderful that we have four? There's four. Now, only one guy gets paid. We're just being upfront about it, okay? <laughs> but, but, but there's way to show value to the other men. Besides the remuneration aspect in regards to finances. But isn't it wonderful to, to know that you have other men that you can call on? Um, interesting because, you know, right now, I'm not, a, I'm not 100% yet. You know, um, pushing on to six months ago, you know, when they 
cracked open my chest, Larry and I can relate in regards to this. It's a violent act, you know, and they open you up and they, there's residual effect that's still going on. I was asking Larry the other day, even before we, we had prayed earlier uh, today, I was saying, I was asking him maybe a week, or, I guess, ago or something like that. I mean, I was saying, I still got this, you know, he said, oh yeah, I still, and he was like a better than a year on me, you know, before, you know, when he had to have his surgery. And so, we're all kind of still dealing with this stuff, you know, and from time to time, and it's going to come up again pretty soon, if from time to time, I call on the other men, can you come in and, and do this? And, and to be honest with you, I, I, feel, I feel kind of bad about that. I feel like I'm a flake or something, and I have to talk to myself and say, no, you know, they opened up your chest, guy. It's okay. You know, and what a blessing it is to have Keith and to have Tony and to have Brian. It's, it's, it's tremendous. In any case, there is that. And there's ways to show all of them value. And I'll leave that to you <laughs> to, to go on with that. But there are those of us who have been commanded of the Lord, who proclaim the gospel regularly to get our living from the gospel. By the way, the word living right there, that's zao, and it is a present active infinitive, which means it's making an ongoing regular living from the gospel. Present tense, ongoing. Uh, it's expected. And he's speaking to those of us who proclaim the gospel that we are to be involved with that. Um, remember last week when I took you over to Galatians 6? Take a look again at Galatians 6. Sixth chapter of Galatians and the sixth verse, really going down to at least uh, verse 9. Galatians 6, 6, the one who is taught in the word who is katekeo, regularly, present tense, regularly taught in the word. The one who is taught the word is to share, koinonia, all good things with the one who teaches him. Koinoneo, another present tense verb, and it's, it's active uh, in the voice, uh, and the mood is imperative. So it's like commanded. Uh, those who are taught in the word are commanded to share uh, all good, now the word things right there is really not in the Greek, it, it's good, agathon in its plural, so it's like share your goods, that's the way it comes out. So those who are taught in the word are to share continuously all goods with the one who teaches. Don't be deceived, God is not mocked what a man sows that he will reap. Now in the context right here, most people quote this way out of its context whenever you hear it, right? You know, yeah, you reap what you sow. Blah, blah. But see, this is, this is where this is, is quoted from, and it's in the middle of sowing to the one who teaches you, is what this is saying. And so there is a reaping, a getting back from the Lord, when you sow to your teacher, sharing all good things with the one who teaches you. Verse 6, verse 8, for the one who sows to his own flesh, that means one who keeps the the goods, and doesn't share with the teacher. That's what that means, sowing to your flesh. For the one who sows to his flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, destruction. But the one who sows to the Spirit, what does that mean? Who shares with the teacher, right? Sowing to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life or a quality of eternal life. Let us not lose heart in doing good. That means sharing with your teacher. For in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. I'm so tired of paying this guy. Well, you know, you're going to, unless you want to skip the corruption aspect, don't get too tired. You know, if you are receiving ministry of the word, then there is this indebtedness that is there. That's just one aspect of the word. We talked to you last week about 1 Timothy 5, verses 17 and 18, right? That the elders that rule well are worthy of double honor. And the word for honor is dime. Can be translated honor, could be translated pay. Worthy of double pay, especially those who labor in the word and in doctrine. See, and then he actually quotes uh, Deuteronomy 25, 4 right there about not muzzling the ox while it treads out the grain. I've been called an ox a few times. Don't muzzle the ox while it treads out the grain. And other aspects, like I said earlier, Jesus said, Matthew 10.10, 10, that the laborer, the, the gospel laborer, is worthy of his hire. Worthy of his hire. And of course, that should never be abused. That should never be abused. Um, 
never be abused. At the same time, there is the aspect of, am I valuing those whom the Lord has given and raised up and put over me to bring spiritual nourishment to me? So do I appreciate a righteous remuneration, which then brings us secondly into appreciating a ministry under compulsion. Paul moves on in verse 15 at 1 Corinthians 9. And says, but I have used none of these things, and I am not writing these things that it be done so in my case. For it would be better for me to die than to have any man make my boast an empty one. If I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for I am under compulsion. For woe is me if I do not preach the gospel." Back to the top of verse 15, he's concerned. He wants them to know that he has used none of these things. In other words, he has not made it an issue to the Corinthians. He has not insisted upon any remuneration. You know, he's a leather artisan. Uh, he can make his living just fine. But he recognizes that they need to do this. But right now, they're in a place where they're so immature, they're so fleshly, that for him to press it would blow the work that has been done so far right out the door because of the present state of carnal influences that are happening uh, within uh, the people there at Corinth. So he doesn't push it because they're immature. He says, I've used none of these things. I've taken advantage of none of these things. And he wants them to know, I am not writing uh, these things so it will be done so in my case. I'm not bringing this up right now so that you will start doing something for me. He wants them to know right away that he's not doing this so that you up it or something like that. For middle of 15, it would be better for me to die than to have any man make my boast an empty one. Um, what's his boast? His boast is at the top of verse 15. I have used none of these things. And that's important to the Apostle Paul. His independence from these people at their current state or lack of maturity, his independence from them is important to him at this. He does not want to be lined up with some of these traveling philosophers or guys who are just out there peddling the word of God. In fact, we get over to 2 Corinthians, the second chapter, and he's going to talk about that. We are not like those, he's going to say, who are those who are like peddling the word of God for profit. It's not what this is about. And it should never be about that. Um. And, of course, you're very much aware of, a, of an awful lot of these guys that are on TV that do exactly that. We don't hear about them as much as we maybe did once upon a time, but peddling the word of God for profit and turning, you know, your seed sown into some sort of miracle and send in five bucks and, you know, God will, God will be, you'll be sowing this into your life and God will send you back 500 and it's theft. It's just theft. And all these guys need to be put in jail because they're stealing from people and they're using religious provocation. They're provoking you with religious items like what the scripture has to say out of its context in order to get you to give to them. And it's just theft. It's fraud is what it is. 16. And here's why. Here's why we can appreciate a ministry that is under compulsion. He says, if I preach the gospel... I have nothing to boast of because I am under, he says, compulsion. I am under compulsion. I am under anagki. Anagki. That is a force of necessity. There is something that is compelling the apostle, compelling him towards an obligation to preach the gospel. He says... If I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for I'm under compulsion to do so. He started, he started the entire epistle off that way, uh, didn't he? In, uh, in chapter 1 and in chapter 2, he says, uh, verse 2, For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's going to be the extent of my philosophical brain work, right? 
my intellectual morass coming at you, that I determined to know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Well, Paul, what do you think of the current state of uh, the situation there in Libya? I know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Yeah, but don't you think the Romans should knock off the taxation here? I mean, it really bugs me. Jesus Christ and him crucified. You're just forcing them back to the most important, most compelling most important aspect of their lives, Jesus Christ and him crucified. I mean, he does that from the very beginning. And so when we get to chapter 9 and verse 16, he says, man, I'm, I'm under compulsion to do this. You know, Jeremiah the prophet, he was under compulsion. In Jeremiah 20 and verse 9, in Jeremiah 20 verse 9, Jeremiah says, man, if I decide that I'm just going to stop preaching in his name, I'm going to take off my prophet's robe and, you know, I've had enough of all of this, you know, and talk about not being valued. Boy, Jeremiah was completely undervalued, right? And I'm going to take my prophet's robe off, you know, I'm going to set my prophet's belt off to the side and I'm just going to sit over here and just, you know, I'm done. I'm done with this lack of appreciation. And he says, but, but I am so compelled within me, it's like a fire shut up in my bones. And when it's on the inside, it's got to come out. See, he's compelled. And so for 40 years, he's preaching, not seeing one convert, not one. Compelled. I'm compelled. Do you think he was pleasing to the Lord? Pleasing to the Lord? In Amos chapter 3 and verse 8, Amos 3 and verse 8, it says, the Lord has given revelation who can but prophesy. In other words, when the Lord speaks, who can stop themselves from the compulsion of prophesying, speaking forward God's word? When you are a receptor of the true living word of God, it is within you to pass that on, to teach that to somebody else, see? When God speaks, a believer is compelled and is driven to share what God has said. In Acts 4 and verse 20, Acts 4 and verse 20, the apostles have been drug in once again in front of the Sanhedrin. And they've been telling him, telling them, you guys better knock off this preaching. You better stop it right now. I'm telling you right now. And Peter says, we cannot help but speak the things that we have seen and heard. They're compelled to do it. Compelled, under compulsion, under a force of necessity. You know, Jesus said the same thing. In Mark, the first chapter, Mark 1, verses 37 and 38, at the very beginning of his ministry, and Mark's the only one that says this in this way, by the way, the, the boys are looking for Jesus, and they finally find him, and they say, gosh, where have you been? Man, all men are looking for you. He'd just been through doing some miracles. And he said to them, let's go. Let's go to the other towns so I can preach there also, for this is why I have come. To preach. Now, of course, he didn't just, just come for that. We, we understand that. But notice how Mark, he's the only one in all the Gospels that gives that inference, that strong of an accounting right there, that this is why I have come, to preach the word. And, of course, Paul's going to say the same thing to Timothy as Paul gets ready to die and go under the, the, the Roman sword, as it, as it were, in 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter. He's going to say, Timothy, here's, here's the most important thing I can say to you before I die. Preach the word. Preach it in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come. When men will no longer give heed to this thing, but they just want to have their itching ears tickled, see. And they will line up to listen to these false men in droves, and they'll be carried away into the land of myth. I mean, if there was ever a time to value the ministry of the word through the men whom God has given you, is this not the time? He says, I'm under compulsion, bottom of 16, and woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. That, that Hebrew word woe we've been discovering in Habakkuk, that, that word woe has everything to do with the threat of an impending judgment that is coming upon if I 
don't do what I'm supposed to do or, or I do what I'm not supposed to do. And that word woe is placed there. Paul's saying the same thing now. He's, he's drawing that Old Testament idea of an impending judgment. If I don't preach the gospel, there is an eternal as well as an immediate consequence. He doesn't tell us what that is. But there's a consequence by me not preaching the gospel. He says in, in 17, as he moves out of appreciating a ministry under compulsion into finally appreciating a gospel of no charge, he says, for if I do this voluntarily, I have a reward. But if against my will, I have a stewardship entrusted to me. What then is my reward? That when I preach the gospel, I may offer the gospel without charge so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. Yeah, there's a reward, he says at the top of 17. There's a reward. He says, look, if I do it voluntarily, I have a reward. I have a misthos. It's the Greek word for pay, for paycheck. Yeah, there's a reward. There is temporal reward in that those who value the ministry are obligated to then, you know, show remuneration of some sort. Sure, a practical remuneration. There is that. We've already looked at Galatians 6.6. 6. We've already heard quoted uh, 1 Timothy 5 verses 17 and 18 that the elders that labor in the word and doctrine are worthy of double honor or double pay. He says, yeah, there's a reward. There's a, a mythos if I do this voluntarily. But guess what? What if it's against my will? What if I pull away? What if I do like Jeremiah talked about, fantasized about doing, pulling away from that, that ministry of, uh, of prophesying like he was called to do? Well, he says, if it's against my will, if I do it against my will, guess what? I have a stewardship entrusted to me. I have an oikonomion. I have an administration or a responsibility that's on me anyway. There's a responsibility. In other words, the call means you follow through. Now he's speaking to those of us who have that responsibility to open up the word and to minister and to shepherd and to feed the people. He says, if I do it voluntarily, great, there's a reward. But if I, if I pull away and I decide I don't want to do it, if you've been called, you are required to follow through anyway, regardless. Don't you think there's been, there's been times? I've been at this for a long time. Don't you think there's been a couple times where I've just said, I'm done. <laughs> I mean, I got stories, I could tell you, and some of you are a part of my stories. You've been through some of this stuff with me, you know. It just gets old, but it's like a fire shut up in your bones. And you are compelled. You are compelled through a force of necessity and a compelling obligation to set forth the claims of the word of God upon the people of the generation that he has called you to. He says, I have a stewardship entrusted to me or a responsibility, a management of responsibility entrusted to me, so I'm going to follow through anyway. Even if, if I have those times where it's like totally against my will and I've had it and I'm done. And he says, in light of that, verse 18, well, what then is my reward? I mean, he just got through saying at the top of 17, I have a reward. But then he, he presses it even for, further. What then is my reward? Well, I thought we just found out what that was. It's, you know, practical remuneration. He, and he goes, no, there's something else. There's something else. And really, every, every elder, every teaching elder called into the ministry of the word, needs to have this attitude. We all need it. He says, what my reward? That when I preach the gospel, verse 18, I may offer the gospel without charge. Without charge. In other words, without expectation of remuneration. Yes, yes, the word of God says that it is, it is theirs. It is their right. It is my right. Yes. There is a value structure set up in the old and under the new covenant for those who minister the word. Yes. But Paul says the real pay, the real payday is offering it free of charge as unto the Lord. Because I got to tell you, the Lord's got a payday system that's a whole lot better than anything anybody on this earth can offer you. 
Now that may say, sound a little hyper spiritual. I don't know. But I'm telling you, the Lord, do you think the Lord knows how to give a good gift? I mean, you, you might have thought that mom and dad during Christmas while you were growing up gave you some hot stuff. You might have thought that. Like mom and dad, you know, I, when I was growing up, when it came to birthdays and Christmases and stuff like that, the real gift that was going to be the hottest gifts, that were going to be the best gifts, that were going to be what I wanted, you know who they were coming from. Yeah, well, they're coming from mom and dad in my house. You, grandma and grandpa, was your? Uh, yeah, okay, all right, all right. But in my house, it was my house. It was mom and dad. They knew what I wanted, and you could depend on them, you know, for the really good stuff. Well, our heavenly Father way beyond blows them away. Can you wait, men? Can can you wait? Because by waiting. We're guaranteeing that there is a spiritual focus for reward that exceeds anything on this fleshly, earthly plane. He says uh, that I may offer the gospel without charge. Why? So as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. What's his right? Verse 14. Verse 14. The Lord has directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. That's his right. But he says, I'll offer it free of charge so I don't have to make full use of my right. Because you know what Paul says? Man, I'd rather die than make that boasting of mine go away. I don't want to have, I, I got a guaranteed way of showing that nobody is, Paul is saying, that nobody is ever going to line me up with any of these profiteer religious word mongers, if you will. I just won't take any money from you at all. How's that? How's that? And that takes care of that. And Paul was okay with that. How far away that is from the average pastor in the average so-called Christian church here in America with his expense account, with his uh, money to go on trips, with paid vacations, with a church credit card or cards, uh, with his f five and six figure salary. Yeah. Yeah. Now I mean big five figures. And the you've heard of the company car, there's the church car, you know. And I am deeply offended by this. And if somebody offered it to me today, I am telling you I would turn it down. I would tell I would turn it down. Because what matters is being where God has called you with the people whom God has called you. That's what matters. And if you're about that, if you're about climbing the ladder, and it's like, I, this, is, this looks pretty good, you know, to me from the outside, I think I'll go ahead and take this giant, humongous thing, kind of a thing. You might as well be sidling up next to a curse. Because that's all you're... How do we conclude this? How do I value or undervalue ministry? Well, if you value it, you will first of all do your best to make sure that the ministry is appropriately remunerated. And then that just then that's just common? Isn't that just typical? Sure. If you're if you're conscious of that and thankful to the Lord, then you do what the Lord would have you do in regards to that. That's what verse 14 says, that there is a a direction that those who proclaim the gospel are to get their living from the gospel. Well, that means that's where you kick in. That's where you step up. It just is, right? Galatians 6.6, 6, if you're taught in the word, you owe a debt to your teacher. That's what it says. And approaching that in a right way is the best way. Because it's as unto the Lord. Secondly, do I value or undervalue ministry? Well, a ministry that is to be valued is always a ministry that is done under compulsion. Under compulsion. Are you compelled? Are you sitting under men who are compelled to bring the word to you in all of its fullness? The happy stuff as well as the things that are not so happy that make us change and things like that. But do they keep bringing it to you? Not looking to you know, be your best buddy and be your best friend, but to feed you with not just milk but meat and maybe make you chew a little bit harder and conform to it? Sure. Compulsion. That's a ministry that is to be valued. A ministry, lastly, that is to be valued 
is one that really, in its essence, would make it available to you even if there was no remuneration. In other words, no charge. No charge. You just do what you're supposed to do. God gave Paul the ability uh, to, work in, to work in leather craft and leather goods. What for? Well, for this. Because <laughs> they're startup situations and there just isn't much money. People do what they can, but you've got to go do what you've got to do. And that just means, you know, get it all balanced out. Now, on the other hand, a guy can't go out and pastor a church, you know, and he's working a full-time job. That's impossible. That's impossible, right? So there is a balance point. So you do what you've got to do. But if you have to, you make it free of charge. And maybe you're in a situation where God's called you to be with a group of people that are just not valuing you too much, right? And you just got to barrel ahead anyway. Barrel ahead anyway, and don't let, don't give them the opportunity of thinking that they can control you relative to your paycheck. Don't ever let that happen. Never let that happen. I value you. I value you. And I know you value me, and I thank you for that. I thank you, all of you, for that. I know that that's a truth. And so we're going to go on appreciating the apostle as we clear our way through the rest of this ninth chapter. Uh, in just a couple of weeks. And so, Father, thank you that you have taught us much in these last two sessions in 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, about valuing the ministry of Christ, really, who this is, and how important it is to be under men whom you have called, recognize that you have called them, and that they have, uh, or they are the men who we are called to sit under. Thank you for that, Lord. And I would ask, Lord God, that, that you would keep the compulsion of preaching the word in season and out season, strong, bright, uh, powerful within each one of us, especially us uh, elders here at Messiah Reformed Church. Keep us compelled, O oh God. And Lord God, let your blessing come back strong. I know, Lord God, that these people here in this church, they are a giving people, O oh God. It's amazing, and we've talked about this a lot. But Lord God, I, 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 I exalt you, and I know they exult and are thankful towards you because you put the funds in their hands so that they might then be responsible to give and show value, uh, Lord God, to the ministry that goes on here so we can keep it going. Lord, thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you for your blessing uh, that uh, truly is made rich upon each one of them, Lord God, and that as they sow those seeds, uh, Lord God, of, of giving and value, that those things come back to them. And I continue, Lord, to pray. Every time I, I look at the weekly giving uh, stats, I ask, Lord, that you would just bring uh, value back to them, to their homes, to their lives, to their checkbooks, to their bank accounts, to their businesses. Bring value back to them a hundred times over, O oh God. God. May that continue. And may none of us, Lord God, ever, ever be drowned out in a sea of fear when it comes to holding back, oh God. Help us to recognize when the test has come upon us. And instead of having the opportunity to give less, we keep it consistent and we keep it going as unto you, Lord, knowing that you are faithful, Lord, to bring it back into our hands like your word says again and again and again. We will not be men and women of flesh displeasing you. We will be men and women trusting in the promises of God that are forever good and forever faithful to us. Thank you for these things, Lord. And speaking of which, as we take the morning offering, Lord, may you be pleased now as we give, Lord, in accordance with your direction uh, for each of us to give. We thank you for the opportunity to do so now. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Sing alleluia to 